Yeah. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm with the Berkeley Food Institute. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the first session of our career panel series. Um, we're so excited to have you here and we're so excited to hear from all of our wonderful speakers. Um, I'm gonna hand it off now to Jesus who will introduce our moderator. Thank you, Kevin. My name is Jesus again. I am also, I'm the graduate student fellow here at the Berkeley Food Institute. And I, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ricardo San Martin, who is the researcher director of the Alternative Meat Program at the Saturja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology here at UC Berkeley. The Alternative Meat Program gives students the opportunity to explore entrepreneurial opportunities in developing animal meat alternatives. And Dr. San Martin holds a, he, he comes from a background where he holds a master's of science in chemical engineering from, from Cal and a PhD in biotechnology from the Imperial College at London. For over 30 years, he has been a hands-on inventor and entrepreneur of plant extracts, some of which have been used today by companies that are developing alternatives to meat. And with that, I will hand that over to Dr. San Martin, um, who will introduce this panel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here with all of you. Um, this is the first of three sessions that organized by the Berkeley Food Institute around the topic of new ways of producing food and what are we eating and the reflection and how that affects our, our, our panel and what are the opportunities, the job opportunities for everyone to participate actively in this space. So I, I, we have four wonderful guests, so I'm not gonna say much about uh, why we are here. And um, I would say, I think the mix, the mix uh, I don't know who exactly chose the, this four or four panelists, but it's, it's a great choice because we have all the way from, um, we're gonna hear from Prachi, that is from the Better Meat Company, where they, they look at plant protein extenders to reduce our dependence on, on, on animal meat. We were gonna listen from Alan Lovewell, which is the founder of Real Good um, Fish, which is all about sustainable catch and, and how to connect uh, the catch uh, and the fishermen with you. And uh, then we will follow up with Monica Martinez, who has a very innovative concept of, with Don Bugito that um, rescue and ancest ancestral food practices and the use of clean ingredients uh, to offer protein snacks based on edible insects and Native American ingredients. And then finally, from Min Tsai, who is the founder and the CEO of Hoda Foods, who uh, has been in the space of plant-based foods for a long time, um, providing delicious foods in, from his locally based uh, facilities in, in Oakland. And so with that, uh, we will leave each of, uh, of the panelists, we will give them five minutes and no more five minutes only uh, to introduce themselves, their companies, and most of all, how, what is the journey they've taken to be where they are now. So our first panelist will be Prachi Ja. Prachi. Imagine a world filled with lush green rainforests, sparkling clear water flowing from creeks and rivers, air so fresh you wish you could inhale forever. In this world, you are stunned by the diversity of plants and animals that surround you, from brightly colored butterflies flitting from flower to flower, to majestic elephant families marching purposefully across the savanna. In this world, <clears throat> healthy food and clean water are plentiful, not just for us humans, but also for the millions of other species that we share planet Earth with as well. Unfortunately, this is not the world that we're headed towards. The world's forests are being cut down at breakneck speed, manure flows freely into our water supplies, and our atmosphere is slowly suffocating with excess carbon dioxide. While there are several industries responsible for environmental destruction, one in particular comes up over and over again, the meat industry. Factory farming, a method of intensive animal production, is spearheading this war against nature. The water pollution, carbon emissions, deforestation, and species loss 
caused by factory farming doesn't only harm other animals such as elephants or butterflies, it harms us directly as well. The fifth mass extinction was caused by asteroids 65 million years ago, but the sixth mass extinction is happening right now and it's caused by us. According to the World Wildlife Fund, since 1970, two thirds of all wildlife populations have disappeared in a large part due to corporations clearing native lands for, to make space for cattle and other animal agriculture. However, as the human population increases and the per capita meat consumption increases as well, our collective appetite for meat is going up, not down. Many people have started to recognize how unsustainable current animal protein production is. And around the world, both startups and established food companies are taking the exciting dive into the world of plant-based meat alternatives. As someone who does not eat meat, I'm a huge supporter of meat alternatives. However, plant-based meat still makes up less than 1% of total meat sales and is often several times the cost of its animal-based counterparts. At the Better Meat Co., a plant protein ingredients company in Sacramento, we think it's awesome that plant-based products have made it into the meat aisles of many grocery stores, but we wanna take it one step farther and integrate plants into the meat itself. We create innovative plant-based protein blends that we sell directly to meat producers to blend into their products, thereby significantly decreasing the total animal meat in the final product by 30 to 50% while boosting protein, while boosting nutrition and maintaining cost parity. Nature is full of underappreciated but delicious plants, several of which we utilize in our blends, such as pea, bamboo, and algae. If Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods are the Teslas of the alternative meat space, then Better Meat Co. is the technology advancement that allows conventional cars to greatly, greatly increase their fuel economy. There's a reason electric cars only make up about 1% of the vehicle market, and our, our approach is to improve the remaining 99%. Think about it. If 99% of all cars improve their gas mileage just 10 to 15 miles per gallon, it would reduce reliance on fossil fuels more than all the electric cars combined. Just as moving away from fossil fuels for energy requires a variety of alternatives, such as solar, wind, or geothermal, moving away from factory farming will also require a diversity of innovative approaches, including both plant-based and hybrid options. When I was a student at Cal, which was actually not too long ago, I studied biology with no intention of becoming a doctor and no real idea what to do with my major after graduating. The summer before my junior year, I somehow got a hold of a book called Clean Meat, written by Paul Shapiro, who by some twist of fate would hire me at his company, The Better Meat Co., two years later. Clean Meat opened my eyes to the possibility of using science for something that combined my passions for environmental and human health, food production. After reading that book, something clicked in me that set the trajectory for where I am today. After that summer, I started to immerse myself in the food landscape at Berkeley. Cal has awesome resources for students interested in sustainable agriculture, such as the Food Systems Minor, which unfortunately I was not able to do, the Food Science and Technology Club, and my personal favorite, the Berkeley Food Institute. I wasted a lot of time in college worrying about what jobs I could get with my biology degree. Looking back, I realized that the most important thing is to choose a major that you are genuinely interested in and excited about, like I was with biology. This likely applies to all many other industries as well, but I can say for certain that the sustainable food industry, we need all types of people with all types of backgrounds. We need data analysts and graphic designers and marketing experts and scientists and writers and artists and activists. Think back to the beautiful and harmonious world we imagined at the beginning humans working with nature rather than against it. Prosperity, not just for our generation, but for many, many generations to come. I am confident that this is the world that we all hope for. Yet our species continues to push in the opposite direction instead, towards a world of recurring pandemics, climate change, and widespread suffering for both humans and non-humans alike. It is such a privilege to be a student at Cal, and I advise you to spend your time figuring out what you really care about and how you can harness your power as a Berkeley student to create positive change. I feel incredibly lucky to go into work every day, doing, knowing I'm doing my part to create a future we can all be excited about. And I wish the same for you. A world of opportunity awaits you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prachi. Wow, that was very good. Thank you, thank you so much. That's great. Um, so now with that, uh, we will invite 
Alan, Alan, it's your turn. Surprise us with. with <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fred. Well, Dr. San Martin, thank you for the introductions and everyone at the Food Institute for inviting me to this panel discussion. Um, it's hard to imagine having been doing what I've been doing now for the past eight years that I was also a graduate student and then before that an undergrad student who is questioning what I will be doing with the rest of my life, uh, either myself or my parents asking me that. Um, so I, <clears throat> I'm going to try to put myself back in, in those shoes. But I would say that one of the main things um, about you know my journey and what we do here at Real Good Fish um, through and through in terms of our values and, you know, the way with the organization was founded and, and run, um, and the vision that we hold for the future, um, is personal and, and is deeply tied to my experiences and the, the learning and the figuring it out and the mentors and just sort of the unrelenting curiosity that I've always had. And so, um, you know, to give you a glimpse in terms of my journey and, and how I ended up here is, you know, deeply tied to, you know, personal experience growing up as a child in Martha's Vineyard in New England and being the son of a journalist. And you all know how the nature of a journalist is really tied to, you know, inquiry and, and, and curiosity. And so as a child, I was wandering the docks with my father and, and, um, you know, talking to fishermen and, and obviously as a kid, you don't think much about what those experiences might bring into the future. Um, but fast forward, you know, through undergrad, which arguably I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I knew that I was good at, at problem solving and art and, and creative pursuits. Um, finding myself teaching sailing in the leadership school down in Baja, Mexico. And it was there that my eyes were open to uh, the global nature of our fisheries and specifically the vulnerabilities of coastal communities um, that one depend on the ocean and natural resources for subsistence and, and living, um, while also being vulnerable to you know large globalized fishing pressures that um, were extracting a tremendous amount of resource from these communities and and putting um, food safety at risk. And so understanding that and then reflecting back on my childhood um, of, you know, following my father on the docks and understanding that actually the stories that I was listening to as a child were not good stories. The stories that my father was writing about were bad stories. There are stories about fishermen losing their jobs. There are stories about resources being depleted. Um, there are stories about communities, you know, uh, wondering what, how to move forward in light of these changes. Um, and so putting all these pieces together, I, you know, decided to go to graduate school. I ended up at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, you know, pursuing a degree in international environmental policy. Um, and it was there that I was starting to put these pieces together and understand that the way in which we live our lives, the way in which we um, consume food and in our relationship to food had everything to do with the livelihoods of not just people in our neighboring towns, but people in countries thousands and tens of thousands of miles away. And as I learned more, I learned that, you know, 90% of the seafood they were consuming in this country was imported. Um, and so the likelihood of us actually eating domestic seafood was very slim. And so you know, I ended up doing a that's graduate degree and ended up meeting some fishermen along the way in New England at uh, as an intern at the international at the New England Fishery Management Council, and from there um, learned about this unique business model called the community supported fishery. And at the time, this was in 2009, um, they had founded their first ones in 2007. So here I was learning about this innovative business model that had yet to emerge in, on the West Coast. And so I knew that um, there was an opportunity to, to take that idea and, and see what I could do. Um, and I wrote this business plan and uh, ended up continuing, not thinking much of it, uh, did a Sea Grant Fellowship up at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center at NOAA and, you know, was really, again, on this track of pursuing policy and management. 
um, the economic downturn was still very real and job prospects of getting a public job. And that's my five minute alarm. <laughs> um, but the prospects of getting a job were not good. And this business plan was in my hand. And, you know, I felt so strongly and so, um, so strongly and so passionately about my experiences, what I had seen and the education I had received and was encouraged with the help of some friends and mentors to launch this business. And here we are eight years later, um, we're now a national seafood distribution company that's focused in on local communities, sourcing direct from fishermen and providing that seafood direct to individuals and families at home. And the idea is that we can provide a deeper connection and sense of responsibility and stewardship if we all are participating in a much tighter, closely woven supply chain related directly to the health of individuals and families and communities and do so as a conscious consumer and participant in you know, the sustainability and the future of the world we wanna create. So it's cool to be on this panel and um, that's how I got here. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I was very curious about this story. So that's how your father shaped you, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if my kids are going to write the book Surviving Daddy or <laughs> they're going to tell a good story that I give us. <laughs> Surviving Daddy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Very, very encouraging. Uh, so now, uh, Monica, turn your camera on. It's your turn. Camera. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, uh, okay, your five oh, minutes, go for it. I go for it. It's really yeah. actually exciting. Thanks for being here for the invitation, but also very excited to hear Alan's story because my story doesn't go that far. Um, my background, I'm going to see if I can share some screen really quick. My background is actually um, in industrial design and you know creative arts. Um, I never thought I was going to own a food business. I never thought about that. So my journey started when I moved from Mexico to Boston to go to school and then to question um, where food came from because food tasted completely um, different from my country. And then I found out, find out the cafeteria food, we didn't have that concept in Mexico. Food was frozen and that's what it tasted horrible. Um, so my journey to start questioning what how food travels and how much food travels actually began in undergrad, um, but didn't catch me until I was in graduate school um, doing, um, I worked as an architectural designer for many years and in graduate school, I decided to go back to school to be a sculptor, actually, I wanna be an artist. Um, <laughs> to the surprise, I find myself working in graduate school nonstop and researching about all those spaces the food you know, leaves and travels, refrigerators, cardboard boxes, um, cans, warehouses, uh, shipping containers, and to I got you know to a alarming uh, fact of factory farms, um, and that's when then um, I start questioning about why why we raise food, why we why we grow food the way that we do, and why our food has to travel, and you know. Uh, be in those spaces that now are fully designed uh, to protect of um, to make healthy food healthy. Um, so at the same time, I was traveling to Mexico. Um, I'm from Mexico, and Mexico is one of the leaders on actually edible insects. We have over 500 varieties of edible insects. Um, I wasn't sure I had some insects experience when I was little. I grew up in the city, so I wasn't exposed to much of, of you know the actually entomophagy, the practice of eating insects. Um, but I remember I had an uncle who uh, used to take us, me and some other cousins to the countryside and expose us to you know, this, some of these insects. Um, so I talked to him and went to Mexico and traveled around Mexico and started learning. Uh, it happens that actually a lot of architects that I was fascinated by were actually inspired by insect architecture. And that's when also I started um, investigating about beehives and other types of insects. And I kind of start making a connection about like insects and food and how much we have biomimic um, insect uh, architecture and, you know, like granaries, we have built granaries since, you know, long, long time, thousands of years ago. And then in some way, 
something clicked me and said like, well, why can't we start um, farming insects? But to my surprise, it came out to uh, learn that most of the insects that we eat in Mexico, they cannot be actually farmed. But I came across the United States was one of the biggest uh, producers of farm insects. Um, and then so you eat farm chicken or farm fish. Uh, you eating insects because a lot of the insects farm in the United States, they get to be farmed to pump protein levels of farm chickens and farm fish. So that's when some kind of idea came to me and say, well, why don't we get rid of the chickens and the fish and go straight to the protein so I came back to the United States. And at the same time, I was still working as an artist and I have a show in New York City and I present, I took me a year actually to develop this set of farms. Um, I'm gonna see if I can show you these farms. Uh, one second, this is a little bit uh, informal, but I I developed this little very easy cardboard box with a plastic container. So I learned how to grow mealworms in my studio space. It took me a couple months, almost a year. I was suffocating them. I was killing them, bacteria. I never worked with a living organism. Finally got them to, um, these are beetles, mealworms are actually beetles, um, got them to, you know, to farm them. And then I present this set of works in this gallery space. And next to the gallery space was this place that back then it wasn't famous, now it's very famous, the Brooklyn Kitchen. And then the Brooklyn Kitchen came and said, why don't we host a dinner with the insects that you've been growing? So we host a very informal dinner for 40 people. I gather all my friends, my, my husband, um, he was trained as a chef. So we, we host a dinner for 40 people. It was a success. And it came out in the New York Times um, front page of the dining section. Um, so I'm sure I pissed a lot of chefs at the time. I never thought that that was gonna be, you know, the opening call for edible insects, opened the dialogue for edible insects as food. So in 2009, that was 2009, 2010. In 2010, 11, Don Bugito came to exist. Uh, came back to San Francisco. Um, and then a food network uh, came to my house. They asked me if I could cook a, um, a dinner for them or lunch. And then right in national television, the host of the show asked me, so what's next? And then I asked a food truck that's gonna serve a full menu of edible insects. And then that's actually when Don Bugito was born. Um, I never cook in my life. Um, at the same time in San Francisco, the booming of food trucks was happening. It was you know, 2010. I thought it was easy. I wrote a business plan. Luckily, close to my house, there was this place called La Cocina, which is a nonprofit food, um, organization. I went there, they told me write a business plan, never brought a business plan before. I did my best. I got into the incubation program. And in 2011, Don Bugito was launched in the San Francisco Street Food Festival. Uh, here you can see we were next to the slanted door. Um, and I developed a full menu of edible insects, farm edible insects. And then to my surprise, we sold out. People were ready. Uh, it wasn't easy, but people were ready to eat edible insects. And then from there, the story is just, you know, these were one of the pictures of the dishes that I developed. Um, a wax moth larva taco with, with blue corn, organic blue corn tortillas, um, toffee mealworms with vanilla ice cream with prickly pear syrup. So after that, the journey hasn't stopped. In 2017, I opened my own farm operations as a challenge. We were challenging getting the supply of insects. So we opened the farm operations and now Don Bullito is an edible insect snack company. So thank you, Monica. I think I went way over my five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Amazing. Um, right. That's great. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, our last panelist, Min, are you ready? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Go for it. Uh, um, uh, so my name is Min. I'm the founder of Hodo. And uh, I, I grew up in Vietnam. I used to catch insects under the lamplight and, and, and cook them and eat them myself. Um, and I also caught a lot of local fish on rivers and whatnot. Um, and I, I want to live in, in that uh, imagined 
um, world that Prachi described so I can catch my own insects and, and my own fish to eat. But instead, um, I have a tofu company, a plant-based food company. Um, I tell people that the reason I, I ended up there is because I'm, I'm not your, um, your, your typical immigrant refugee, nor am I your, your standard employee. Um, you know, in that um, my, my parents wanted me to, to do practical things, and I always end up just doing whatever the heck it is that interested me. Um, so, so that's how I ended up starting a, a plant-based food company. Um, the, the other reason is every job that I was um, I employed me, um, I get bored. So every few years, I need, I need a new job. I need to do something different. So I'm a terrible employee. Um, but, but one good thing about being curious and, and being sort of an autodidact and, and always wanting to try something new is, um, is to start a business. That way you, you can never have enough time to solve all the business problems. Um, I started a food company because um, like Alan, it was during a recession. Um, prior to that, I was an investment banker and uh, the, finan the financial world is uh, very susceptible to recessions. So um, I love food. Most of my credit card bill is on food. So I thought, why not start a food business, um, which is a little bit more recession proof. Um, so I started the business in 2004. Um, a little over 15 years ago. Um, it was a fertile ground for, for business in the Bay Area for many reasons, uh, primarily because it was the organic movement, the farmer's market movement, the artisan movement. So a lot of my peers at the time are people in, in the Bay Area nationally recognized food companies from Blue Bottle to Cowgirl Creamery to Strauss Creamery. Um, so, you know, Scharfenberger chocolate. So it's a really wonderful time uh, to launch something. And um, I chose to launch Tofu um, because A, I was kind of crazy and because I couldn't find a good tofu that I grew up eating in Vietnam. Uh, it's really a silly product to launch uh, in a way because nobody knew what it was, nobody knew what to do with it. But it's also fortunate because um, it was so such a discreet product that um, over the course of time, I really didn't have um, competition. Um, so, so it really allowed me to grow the business uh, sustainably, um, innovatively, and introducing um, new, new products and new innovation uh, into the space. And um, one of the benefits of uh, being patient and having time on your side is you can ride many waves. And Hodo as a company has ridden many waves you know, everything from organic to local to keto to basically, you know, people not eating starches. And today we're, we're in this massive wave called plant-based. And, um, and, you know, I jokingly say to people, um, which is we're the original plant-based food because tofu as the base of our product has been around for thousands of years. So I have a, a wealth of resource to rely upon um, from, from the recipe innovation standpoint. Um, I also have um, basically economics on my side in that it's, it's among the, the most economical plant-based food, the most sustainable plant-based food um, that we have. So while I, I know Impossible and Beyond and, and, and the founders and have been involved with them in various capacities, um, I, I think a lot of the path of plant-based will eventually have to go through soy. And uh, it's unfortunate that these companies don't use organic um, and, and small farm produce heirloom variety soy that we do. But, um, but at the end of the day, I, I think as a food company, um, we, we need to do a few things uh, very well. One is to make sure the products are delicious. So that's our main goal, because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't like it, you're not gonna come back for it. Two is we wanna make it as convenient for the consumers uh, as possible, make it easy. Um, they don't have to do much, open in the pack and heat and eat. And three is to make it economical. So, um, you know, not just to, you know, some, some people say plant-based food is somewhat elite and, and to a certain extent it's true, but, but we wanna make food um, approachable and accessible to everybody. And so economics, making it cheap enough for for everybody to be able to purchase it, it's also important. 
So, so I, I keep those three tenets uh, in mind with, with my business. And uh, today we're, we're a national company. We're in more than 6,000 locations. We supply Chipotle, Target, Costco, Walmart. And we also work at Michelin star restaurants and the commissaries down in Silicon Valley. So I think, um, you know, tofu based, plant based food um, has, a, has a good horizon and it will be around for a while. Um, and before I, I, I sign off um, on my five minutes, I, I want to put a plug out that we're looking for a marketing manager at Hodo um, to do really fun things with our marketing team. So if you're interested, go on indeed.com and, and send in your application. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Mina. I always enjoy your talks. Um, and you don't know this, but when you talked in our class, you were chosen number one. You Thank were the, you. Yeah, you were chosen by the students to be the best speaker I appreciate <laughs> that, that semester in that semester. So anyway, thank you all the panelists. I think it was great. I mean, in the, um, uh, from all different perspectives, I mean, the, it reflects how vibrant this space is of this reflection that we're doing, especially the young generations on what do we eat and uh, how food is defining us uh, in so many ways in affecting our planets in so many ways. So we now have uh, 30, 35 minutes left and uh, we can go directly into some of the questions that um, the panelists I mean, are receiving and that's um, uh, both uh, Jesus and, and Kevin are in charge of selecting those questions and they're gonna put those questions forward. Uh, I just want to ask one question before I, I let Kevin or Jesus um, ask those questions. Uh, and that is to all of you, um, what kind of skills are you looking for? I mean, if you're hiring uh, for your company to make it grow and for everyone that is here, uh, the audience, what skills, how, how you prepare for this for this because it's it's a non-traditional preparation i mean it's not i mean there's no career in any of these topics what what are you looking for what are you looking mean for that person you're going to recruit you're on mute yeah 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 okay, um, good, good. just just a quick quickly um i i think for for i i tell people that i hire people like myself so curious willing to take risks. Um, you know, we have a tremendous culture at Hodo where we promote from within. We work with, you know, 85% of our employees are immigrants. The majority are older and the majority are women. So um, I, I think if you have a curious mind, willing to take risks, um, we'll, we'll take a look. So culturally, people, people who want to move like myself. Great. Anyone else would like to add something? Alan, Monica, Prachi? We are, <laughs> we have this actually, um, we are also very diverse. We are still a very small company. We only have, um, we are a team of six people. Um, but the first test that I usually give is like um, to work with one of our insects which is a superworm, which is a really large type of mealworm. <laughs> <laughs> so if this person cannot really touch it or, or feel comfortable with it, it's like kind of like the fire, the test of fire. <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of a joke, right? But we obviously, same as, <laughs> I mean, we look for people who are very, you know, creative, very excited, um, people who can see beyond, you know, the normal, like the normal, and can, can be excited about the vision of the company. Yeah. Great. So it's about looking. So, so your your previous career, I mean, or not previous. I mean, I'm sure you're an artist. You will be an artist all your life. That help you a lot. How to see? Yeah, well, no, maybe how not to see, right? <laughs> and you get into this. You are. Okay. I'm probably. I'm 100 sure. If I was a business, you know, major or you know, train, I would probably would never get into this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Prachi, Alan, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, sorry, go ahead. I'll just add quickly. Um, yeah, creativity is, is I think, really um, 
important, just at least in, in, I think our organization, I think, and I would guess in a lot of the sort of early stage or even cutting edge sort of organizations that are trying to pave new ways as opposed to replicate old ways. Um, I think just the ability to think beyond sort of the status quo and the ways in which people are used to doing things and being open to the possibility that there's other ways of doing things, um, as I think, you know, really important. Um, it's really hard to break the mold. It's just really, we, we are all products of the mold and it's really hard to break out of it. And I think the ability to show that you, you can, not all the time, but, you know, have the ability to, to leave certain frames of reference. And I think things like travel and, and language and, and diversity are all things that I think help, you know, determine um, someone that is familiar with um, not being part of a mold. Um, so there are, I think, some really interesting aspects about life that can 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 foster that kind of skill set. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, everyone else's assessment. I'm not the CEO of the Better Meat Co., so I don't really make the hiring decisions. But I can tell from looking around my team and even myself, I didn't have any food science background or anything like that. But something that we really value at the Better Meat Co. is just passion for for this specific area. Like if you can show that that you care, then what we what we really look for is that and then we, we pull in people from a diversity of backgrounds kind of like I said in my talk and each person comes with a specific background in like biomaterials or engineering or something but when they come and we're all tackling this problem together it's awesome to have kind of a di diversity of perspectives all looking at the same pro uh, same problem and using prior experience that may not even be related to food and like implementing it in this new way so I think that's really helped us Thank you. Great, great answers. Ah, I wish I was a little bit younger so that I can hire you. I mean, me and probably you could hire me, right? <laughs> but in the I production can still line. Hire you. you wouldn't be the oldest employee. I can still hire you. <laughs> but I like the production line. I'm not, like the office. I like working with the hands. That's where I would put you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we are ready for the questions of the audience. Kevin or Jesus, who will, who will start? It's all yours now. I'm going to mute myself, OK? Thank you, Ricardo. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for such wonderful um, presentations. So we're going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. It's at the bottom. And you can just type in your question there. And um, me and Jesus will be going through them and looking for some good ones. And um, we have a really good question from um, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing, if I pronounce your name wrong, but from Violet Awad, um, who asked for the speakers who started their own business, um, how were you able to afford, uh, afford starting your own business? At this point, any, any of you can yeah. answer? I uh, just <laughs> urge you to brief answers that's my my role here so uh, you want to go first yeah um real quickly i convinced an old boss of mine to lend me twenty two thousand dollars and the terms of that loan were if i didn't pay it off i went back and i worked for him <laughs> I, I got two thousand dollars from literally from my brother um that's how i started with two thousand dollars and yeah and putting back every single penny into the company and working, obviously, having another job, you know, two or three jobs besides the business. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Being creative <laughs> <laughs> and resourceful. <laughs> really important. Min, how about you? You. Uh, I, I, I was doing it on the weekend. I was a weekend warrior when I started out. I, I believe in redundancy. So you always have to have a backup plan. So, you know, I still have a backup plan. <laughs> we'll just go work for somebody else if I have to. So, you know, redundancy is important. So whatever you do, just have multiple backup plans. Uh, that's good to hear that. Yeah. Oh, and I'm not the only one thinking that. <laughs> hey, thank you. Um, Kevin or Jesus. Yeah, so I guess following up, right? How long did it take for y'all to or to get from the business idea to starting up the business. It's kind of taking that question from Hank, um, said in a little different way, but. 
I don't think I don't think that's a, a A and B. I think there's like a nonlinear thing. Having a business, you you have to see it like a nonlinear. You know, it's always growing, it's always evolving. You always need money. You always need to grow. You always is innovation to you know to change things. To I think that's what I, for me that's one of the most exciting things to be a business owner is that challenge. There's always a problem. And that problem is always how you're gonna fix it, how you're gonna, you know, be better, how you're gonna do things better. So yeah, there's not just like I I start, I have an idea, and now I have a business. I wish it was that easy, but that would be boring, probably. <laughs> Any someone else want to jump in to this one? Alan? Yeah, there's a there's a bit of a there's a moment of leap of faith. And I think the one is as soon as you get money from your customers, you're in it. So as soon as someone's paying you to do something um, or to, you know, for your services and for your business, um, you, are, you are now held you know, responsible. And so I think it's from there that you know, that's the first leap. But you know, um, there's a lot of planning that goes before that. And then obviously a lot, a lot more that comes after that. Um, but I would say that that's one of the most distinct inflection points. You know, for us, we, uh, we're a subscription business. So we got all these money ahead of time before you even touch any fish. And it was one of those weird stories where we're like, oh, I guess we're, we're really doing this now because we've got a bunch of people's money that want fish from these fishermen. Um, we better make that happen. And, um, and I think that's where things get real. And then that's where the journey really starts and gets exciting. And, um, but yeah, it never stops. <laughs> I'll tell you, it never stops. I mean, <laughs> myself, I'm still here. I mean, I have a lab in the garage out there. So, I mean, I mean, you want to yeah. say something? I think that's a great way. If you, if, if for the panelists, if you uh, um, turn your your mic on, then I know you want to say something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think um, I have a separate business that consults with startups and um, in the food space and. I always tell them that um, a business plan is great, but, but don't, don't plan beyond C. Just go A, B, C and stop and start working on A because you're gonna move to F and then somewhere else. So the ability to pivot, it's, it's critical for any business. I mean, because of COVID, we're pivoting again, you know? So pivot equates to sustainability. So, um, you know, just take the plunge and have, have a backup plan. So that's the only way to go. Thank you, great. I think just to add that, and I'm thinking more about the question is, um, there is, I mean, the, obviously the, the um, bureaucratic part of having a business and permits, you know, licenses and all that certifications. So there is definitely a time, you know, timeline on that before you can operate um, sometimes you will find out that you can operate without some certifications, then you get certifications. Um, but I feel like if you have a business, an idea, I feel like the best thing is just to start it. Like, um, don't wait for it. Just begin, you know, get it out in the world. Yeah. I think you you just touched both of you a very important aspect that I try to teach my students. It's like, there are two moments very important for the entrepreneur, starting, just doing it. And the second one is this famous movie, Let It Go, which I praise all the students to sing in the class. You know, I ask them to stand up and let it go because sometimes you get in love with that, that idea. You're not going anywhere. So you have to sing, let it go. And, and that helps a lot. It's how to stop sometimes your obsessions. Anyway, uh, another question, Kevin or Jesus, yeah. Sure. Um, so this is a question from Teresa Ria, um, who, at, who is saying, uh, I've been looking for jobs in a sustainable food company, but it seems like creativity and passion and, I, and a diverse perspective, which I all have, aren't enough to get hired. Uh, what actual skills can be useful and um, how do you find, quote unquote, hidden jobs at businesses like yours? Um, I can go first on this one. Um, I think that is also kind of how I felt uh, early last year when I was applying for jobs. I felt like I had all these skills, but I wasn't getting the responses that I wanted from these food companies. So actually how I got my job at the Better Meat Co is completely untraditional. 
I had met Paul, the CEO at the Good Food Conference um, two years ago. And I just cold emailed him. I was like, hey, I just graduated. I need a job. You have a company. What do you say? Um, and then he invited me over for an interview and it went really well. And that's just how I got the job. So I didn't even apply for a specific position. So my advice to you would be, uh, people throw the word networking around a lot, but I would say just go to things that you're interested. If you're interested in sustainable food, attend all the online conferences. A lot of them are free now. Um, try to talk to people. If you have friends working in the space, if you know people in the food science club or at the Berkeley Food Institute that you could talk to, I think the best way to get jobs, especially if you already have qualities that you know these companies are looking for, the best way is just go from, use the network of people that you have and always try to expand that network and that'll help you a lot. Thank you, Rachi. Thank you for that one. Yeah, um, seems okay. So Kevin, another question. Sure, um, this question is for Min specifically. Uh, have you come across any obstacles with expanding your business to older generations? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Older, older. Older. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what the question means, but there's a lot of obstacles that I, I came across as I get older, but also, um, I, there, there's a million obstacles, you know, to, to, from, from the consumer side on the production side. Um, so, so business is about overcoming obstacles. Um, it's a cliche, but it's also true. Um, so I, I hope, uh, ask something more specific. Otherwise, it's really hard for me to answer that question. I think that question, Thank you, Min. You, yeah. you said, uh, Min, your, most of your workers are older folks, right? So I think, I think that question ties into that. Oh, you mean my workers? Mm -hmm. Oh, got it. Yeah. So, so that's very specific because if you, the, the reason I hired uh, older folks and, and immigrants is because I think of my parents, right? Like how can I create an environment that, that they can feel safe working at? So, so when I think about it, if you come here, you come here with your kids. What's important is you want time to take your kids to school and take care of them. Right. And you want a job that has insurance and, and whatnot. So we run 24 seven. So that creates many different shifts for employees. So that creates flexibility, whether you wanna to go to school and learn English, whether you wanna stay home and take care of your parents or take care of your kids. Um, and we find that a lot of these older immigrants, they might have come here for their kids and their English is not great, but they're amazing workers. So for us, it's, a, it's an invaluable set of employees um, that are immigrants that, that, you know, many of them have amazing jobs in their country already, but because of language barriers um, and because of, of all the barriers of looking for work, um, you know, we just want to create the environment that, that suits them. So yeah, we have a lot of people in our company that are in their 50s working for us and, and they're, one, they're among the, the best workers. Thank you, Min. Very inspiring. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. Um, Kevin? Yeah. Um, here's a question for Monica. Uh, what steps do you think are needed to grow the edible insect industry in the US? I'd imagine there's a lot um, of stuff you'd have to do, but what are you thinking about? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, it's an endless. Um... So I think actually Min mentioned something too about tofu, right? The tofu was a product that not a lot of people were familiar with in the United States or had to use tofu. So the main part, um, I've been in the business for almost 10, 11 years. And the first couple of years were heavily about educating people, like education played a giant role on, on acceptance. So first we had to educate people about, you know, why insects, why, you know, why are we thinking, why are we, you know, trying to convince people to eat insects? It was basically most um, nutritional aspects and sustainable aspects of insects. Um, and that came to like, it was very shocking to know that probably 80% of the consumers didn't know actually what sustainability mean, what actually sustainable, the term of sustainable mean. 
So that was another layer of educating people about like, you know, what sustainable means. Um, so that was kind of like the first phase of, our, of my business the education. After we passed that, uh, we got lucky. Um, the, we got a lot of press, um, very positive press over the years. We've been in every single, you know, newspaper. And then that helped a lot. And then before I remember being at, actually at the food, uh, Good Food Awards, um, probably like seven, seven, eight years ago, they invited us to serve some of our little tacos. And then people were like, they would jump back when they would see the insect. And then, then, then we had to like, you know, convince them and talk. There was a lot of talking. And then we got invited five, five years later. Oh, that was way before then. Then we got invited five, six years later. And then, then we got a line. Right, so that tells us that people already knew about it. People been reading, people been hearing about it. Um, some member of their families they already been exposed or have experience to have an insect. So, eighty percent we would say eighty percent of Americans at least are aware that insects can be used as food. Um, so that's a tremendous gain, but it's still a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, Kevin. Um, this question is for everyone. Um, very broad, but uh, what do you wish you knew back when you started that you know now? <laughs> I could even answer that one, but it, that's not. <laughs> I'm not here to answer any questions. So, what? I'll answer that one. I'll start. If I know what I know now, I wouldn't have started the business. <laughs> I, I'm on the same boat. <laughs> if I knew that I won't have any money for, you know, seven years, I won't be here. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably say the same thing. I think it's it's funny because um, it's brutal, but it's but I, I don't know if you all feel the same way. I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else in the same sentence, you know. So you know, maybe back then, if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't do it. But here I am right now. I I wouldn't change anything. Um, so I think it might be good. One of those examples of, of ignorance is, is bliss. And maybe, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I echo that ignorance is definitely a bliss. And then, you know, as Min said, sometimes a business plan is not making, writing a business plan doesn't mean anything. It does help maybe, but step one, but once you jump in, it's a different story, you know, just take a deep breath and just jump in. Thank you. Super, super. Uh, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm tempted. Okay. I'll add, I'll add one thing. Yeah. Finances and accounting. Get really good at that. Or, uh, or at least enough so that you can look at a balance sheet and a P&L and not be confused. Because no matter what you do, no matter what you believe in, no matter um, what your idea is, it all has to equate in the terms of money. And so, you know, I don't, I don't care if you're an artist or if you're an engineer or, or whatever it is, um, wrap your head around the financials early and quickly. And get a friend, a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> get a lawyer friend. I mean, <laughs> that's for sure. That's, that's very important. Um, I think we have five more minutes. Kevin. Yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Ricardo? We'd love to hear. Oh. Uh, no, I just, I'm, I'm impressed by the, oh, yes and no, by the diversity, you know, of, of, I mean, I think, I think you, you and Jesus chose these panelists, right? Yeah. And I see, you know, like, a, um, there was one question, say, how they came together? What, what was the threat? I mean, how, I think you can answer that question, Kevin, because you chose them. So oh. What's the common link? I think there was a question somewhere here. What was the common link between these four four speakers why why you chose them uh yeah um i guess i think prachi touched on this a little bit but like as we're like moving into the future um sustainability is becoming a very and very important issue and a lot of people don't think that um food is like involved in that and that like businesses aren't in a place to make an impact in that but there's a lot of sustainability to be found with um, um, these like new food businesses. 
that um, our reef gathered here today and they've been doing such incredible work and we just wanted to hear from them and see um, how, how it's going, you know? And I don't know, Jesus, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, for sure. I was gonna say that, so me and Kevin both uh, came up with the panelists and the theme of this panel is looking at pro protein and protein alternatives, right? And Prachi also mentioned, right, kind of, um, I think the, the deficiencies that factory meat farming have, right? Um, and every every panelist here works um, with that, like with with alternatives to to meat production um, as it's being made now. And I think that is kind of what we want to focus on, right? By having these panelists talk about their experience in starting their own business or working with a business that deals specifically with alternatives to meat production or fa factory meat farming. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we've all kind of been able to talk about that either directly or uh, adjacently I think and that's mm. um, I think maybe to ask everyone here as well right uh, what do you expect the alternative meat market to look like you know five ten years from now what are these what are the optimisms you hold but also the skepticisms that you also carry with you Anyone wants to jump on that question, and we could we could end with that with that. Like, how do you see? I think it was a question there. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a few things. I, I like what Prachi pa, Prachi said. I I think pe we we have this binary whether you're plant based or you're meat eater, and I I think that's not the right way to look at it. You know, I I think eating, it's about taste, it's about health, and if you throw in sustainability then you have to understand all the angles, you know? So, so mixing, reducing, eating, you know, eating diversity of protein, you know, sustainably from fisheries. I, I think it has to be much more holistic. So, um, but in America, from a marketing standpoint, uh, we, we, we like sensational stuff, you know? So when we talk about trends, it's about something like that's moving like extreme directions. But, but the reality is it, it's not technology. We're dealing with food. Food does not have Moore's law. So it has to be long-term. It has to be sustained. And, and a lot of it has to do with education, right? So an education takes a long time and food companies don't, un unless you're impossible, um, which is brilliant, you know, uh, you don't have the bullhorn to shout. Um, and, and, and Impossible and Beyond are, are like tech company in a way, right? So they, they have the bullhorn to shout and they throw money at it to shout. And it helps everybody else in that space like us. So we benefit from that. But I think the, the, the real conversation and it's really about individuals and stories of how you eat sustainably, um, you know, whether it's Michael Pollan's voting with your dollars and buying what you want to buy, um, or um, the idea of of just not having such binaries, um, I, I think that's really the, the real conversation. I cannot. I mean, I fully agree with you. I'll vote for you, man. I mean, you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about that. You know, I've been leading this alternative. Um, um, program that we have at Berkeley and, and disclaimer for all of you listening I'm not vegan you know I'm the non-vegan director of the vegan program but that adds to the contradiction of human nature I mean all your stories all where you came from I mean you listening to your father Alan uh, the beautiful story um, that was first told by and all of that it, it's about people I mean you hiring old people to work there to fill the it's about people, it's how, and, and food is, it's about us humans. It's not like a cell phone or it's not like a, a thing. It's, it transcends that. So I think working in this space, there's, as someone said, there's room for everyone. And um, I truly thank you, all of you, uh, both the panelists and, uh, and the participants. And with that, I think we are right on time. And I'll let Kevin, 
make an invitation for the panels to come. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank all of you, Monica, Alan, uh, Prachi, Min. Thank you. It was fun. That's the most important thing. <laughs> we had a fun time. Okay. So, Kevin, make the invitation. And thank you, Kevin and Jesus and, and the good, and, and, and sorry, the Berkeley Food Institute for putting this together. Great initiative. And thank you so much, Dr. San Martin. And I'd like just to give a quick shout out to Rosalie and Natalie. If of they want course. to talk yes. about <laughs> your hands for dealing with the technology behind this webinar. Um, and he says, if you want to talk about the next few panels we have. That... Yes, so next next Tuesday, we will. I'm putting the link right now in the chat. We will have uh, our second session, our second panel. Uh, this one will focus on food justice nonprofits from a regional lens, uh, specifically the Bay Area, but also, um, yeah. And yeah, we hope you can join us uh, next Tuesday from 6 to 7, same time. We'll try to keep it one hour, respect everyone's time. But okay. yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Okay. And thank you. And bye bye, everyone. Okay. Mm -hmm.